I would like to share with you what I call the parable of the sofa. Many years ago, there was a young pastor who graduated from seminary. And she was in a mission field, deaf ministry, which meant that she got paid the minimum salary of the Baltimore-Washington Annual Conference and the minimum housing allowance, which was only $600 a month. Not a lot of money. And so she went to her first apartment, which was furnished in early Goodwill. She had a couch and a chair that she had bought when she was a teenager, the set for $15. Now, if you'd look at it, you'd say it was mid-century modern. Then you would just say it was an old piece of junk. And she worked for a few years, and the couch started to shed onto the floor because it was sort of just disintegrating. And she decided she needed a new couch. So she prayed about it and went to Sears, and there was one for $299. But that was a lot of money, not just out of her own paycheck, but she thought about what that money could accomplish for other people and wondered if she should just go to Will and try to find one without critters living inside it. But no, she bought the $299 couch. She had that couch through several appointments. And then she left deaf ministry and started to make more money. And then several appointments later, she needed a new couch because the old one just didn't look so good anymore. It had plenty of life in it, but it didn't look good. And she went to a furniture store, not to Sears this time, and she found a couch that was beautiful but cost $1,300. And she said to herself, that's a lot of money, but you know, I've worked hard and I deserve a nice couch. And she bought it without prayer, without worrying about what it meant theologically. She just bought the nice couch. Guess what happened? Within a year, the arm fell off. Now, if you figured it out, I'm the pastor. I'm the one who used to agonize over whether to spend $299 because I could do something more worthwhile with that money. And then suddenly, I got into this thing of thinking, well, I worked hard for this money. I deserve a new couch. And it was beautiful, and it fell apart. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Because you know what they say, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Well, it's not really a parable since it's a story from my own life, but it is a warning to preachers. Preachers, beware, because the toes you step on may be your own. And this is one of those passages that nobody wants to hear because it is about money. Now, we like to get all hung up on issues of sexuality in the church and fighting about scripture with that. Jesus spoke of money, the way we handle money, the way we use money, the way we hoard money, the way we deal with wealth over 900 times. And this is one of those stories that we don't like because it does step on our toes. Because make no mistake about it, in this nation, we don't have to talk about the 1%, most Americans, most Americans are among the richest people on the face of the earth. You know how I know that? Because we eat every day and we have a place to live or we have access to those things even if we fall on hard times. So this is one of those parables that really strikes close to the bone for most of us. But we've got to figure out what it means by looking at what it doesn't mean. It does not mean what has come to be known as the prosperity gospel, that God wants us all to be wealthy in material things. I reject that. I'm telling you, after a lifetime of studying scripture, I reject that. But by the same token, it does not mean that there is anything wrong with money. That there's nothing wrong with wealth or the accumulation of wealth. Look at what the man did. He had more than he could store, and so he built a bigger barn. Think back to Egypt. Joseph and the Pharaoh. Joseph predicted the dreams and said, Pharaoh, there's going to be a famine, and so he built big storehouses and stored grain away. Nothing wrong with that. Also, how many times have you heard a tithing sermon or a stewardship sermon that says money is bad, therefore give it to the church? <laughs> Haven't we heard those sermons before? That money is the root of all evil, which is a misquote. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money is not condemned in scripture. 
So what is Jesus talking about here? He's not talking about money. He's talking about how we use it. He's talking about greed. And he's talking about the context in which the money is being used, or in this case, the, the crops are being stored away. Because, look at what we just read from the letter to the Colossians. It says, so if you are in Christ, that's not a good translation. The translation really means in English, since we are in Christ, since we have died. And we're wondering, what does he mean we've died? We've been baptized. I said I used to serve in deaf ministry. This is the sign for baptism, to go into the water and come back up, which is very close to the sign for death. Because how many of you have been underwater ever, intentionally or unintentionally? You go underwater and you can't see very well because the sound and the sight and the light are, are sort of closed off and you have to hold your breath. And then what is it like to come up out of the water to breathe again? It's like being reborn. That's what we're talking about with baptism. The old ways are dead and the new ways in Christ have made us come alive. And again, we're given a list of things that we're supposed to watch out for because if we're in Christ, all of us has a new orientation. We are completely in God's realm at that point. We enter into the kingdom fully at that point, which means that God has to be part of the conversation that we have with ourselves when it comes to what we do about anything. Go back to the parable of the rich man. And what does he get called by God but fool? Now, you'll remember Jesus in Matthew's gospel says, if you call someone else a fool, you subject yourself to the fires of hell. So this is a serious condemnation of the man's behavior. It's not that he was wealthy. It's that his context was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. He said to himself, soul. He said, I, my. Now, what did it say about the abundance? The land produced abundance, not the man. It wasn't his hard work. And anyone who has farmed for a living knows that you can work your behind off and sometimes not get anything for it because it's not raining or because insects come in in a swarm and eat your crops. There are so many reasons a crop can fail. But it is not his work that has gotten him this great harvest. It is the land itself. And who does the land belong to but God? And the man does not even mention God. There is no thanks to God. There is no, my land is produced abundantly. Thanks be to the Lord who brings the rain, who brings the nutrients from the soil. No, and who else doesn't he think about? He doesn't think about anyone around him who may have need. It's all about himself. I think if we were to picture this man, we'd picture Ebenezer Scrooge, wouldn't we? The man who sat alone because all he could focus on was hoarding for himself instead of looking at the needs in the world around him. It was all about me. That's what the idolatry is in this passage. That is what Jesus is warning against, not against being wealthy, but against being so consumed with money, so consumed with possessions, so consumed with accumulation that we miss the bigger picture. The bigger picture being that all that we have and all that we are is a gift of a loving creator who blesses us so we might bless others, not for our own well-being. It's a hard passage, isn't it? It's me close to home because I went out and bought myself a $1,300 couch because I earned it and I deserved it. I really deserved for it to fall apart in front of me to sort of wake me up to the reality of what I had done. But this is a passage that calls us to examine ourselves. That's what scripture does. And that's why we come to church. We come to church to learn the word of God, not to hear bad people have money, good people give all their money away. It's not about that. But what if this becomes a place where we help each other to discern what it is that God is calling us to do, what it is that God wants to do through us in the world? Now, granted, we are a church that relies on the gifts of people and the financial gifts. But this isn't about that kind of stewardship. This is about the stewardship of everything that we have, the stewardship of creation, the stewardship of our relationships with one another, the stewardship of children, the stewardship 
of our material goods, yes, but the stewards of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I asked you last week, do you remember the homework I gave you at the end of the service last week? Does anybody remember? I asked you to go home and think to yourself, when is the last time I shared the good news of Jesus Christ with another person outside the walls of this building? I hope you did that. And if you haven't done it, I hope you'll do it this week. And if you did it, here comes part two. Part two of that is who are you going to tell? How are you going to tell? We just heard the wonderful story of the Baltimore County Christian Work Camp. And I want you to talk to the people who went there. And I want you to hear the stories about Miss Mary. I want you to hear about how giving to others changes not just their lives, but it changes your own life because it reorients us to being the people of God in Jesus Christ who have died to our old ways and who have entered into a new way to come. Jesus said, be careful where your treasure is because that's where your heart is. If you store things up for yourself here, then you're not thinking about heaven. But don't go too far with that. I forget who said it. I think, I think it maybe was Oliver Wendell Holmes. I'll have to look that up again. But who said, don't be so focused on heaven that you are no earthly good. Don't be so fixated on storing up treasures for yourself in heaven. But when you learn to share the abundance of what God has given you, when you learn to share the abundance of the gospel, when you learn to share the abundance of your compassion and your grace and your forgiveness of others, when you learn to share Christ above all else, then you are storing up for yourselves treasure that cannot be destroyed. So please don't leave here saying, oh no, another sermon about money, because that wasn't me, that was Jesus. We could sum this up by saying, you know, you've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul, right? It's not about that. It's not about that. It is about living fully in Christ, letting the old ways go, entering into the new and abundant life that God wants to give you. Now, this does hit close to home for me. Because most of you know I am trying to sell my home in West Virginia so that I can actually live where I work full time. So finances are preying on my mind right now. They really are. Because it's less expensive to buy a house in West Virginia than it is in Baltimore County. And part of me wants to be consumed with the worrying about what's going to happen to me. Part of me is thinking I'm going to have to be working a long time to pay off a house that's okay because I trust that my life is in God's hands and the more I trust the more I let go of my worries and my concerns and things like that there are people clergy are allowed you may not know this we are allowed to opt out of Social Security did you know that clergy can opt out just as the Amish can opt out as conscientious objectors to the idea of storing things up on earth I pay my Social Security. I'm not condemning anyone who puts money away for the future. But just don't put your future away with your money. Because we are called to open ourselves up to God's leading. Which means we have to say, you are Lord of what comes out of my mouth. You are Lord of what comes out of my wallet. You are Lord of what comes out of my heart and your Lord of what I hold on to that I can't let go of. Tough lesson. Sometimes Jesus says things that seem very clear, but they really do step on our toes. I know they step on mine. But we immerse ourselves in this new life by coming together to worship and praise by reading scripture, by examining it, by taking it into our hearts, by coming to this table where we are fed with grace and mercy and peace and the call to newness of life. So I invite you to come this morning with a heart that is open, with a life that is open before God, with a life that says, I'm ready to put the old behind and move into the new. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. 
by being careful with what you do with your treasure on earth. But don't be so focused on your own future that you're no earthly good here because this is where Christ has put us. This is where Christ calls us. This is where Christ needs us. Amen.